This is a Digital Music Trends 169 on the 6th of February 2014. The Midem interviews featuring Merlin, Times Music, Impressive PR, Jukli, Rock and Rio, Believe, the Malaysia Recording Industry, Frascona Law, Pledge Music, The Orchard, The Collective, and The Herds, Liechtenstein and Young. DMT's coverage of Medium 2014 was made possible by CI, the leading provider of digital delivery services to the independent community. So make sure you go and check out the website on ci-info.com. Hello everyone and welcome to the Medium 2014 special of Digital Music Trends. I am Andrea Leonali and this is the weekly show where we talk about and try to make sense of the latest news in the digital music industry. A packed episode of DMT today with extracts from 10 out of the 30 odd interviews that I recorded over the past few days in Cannes. I can assure you that the other 20 interviews are just as good, I just haven't quite had the time to edit them all yet. And I will be releasing a full length interview from Medium every day over the course of February, so look out for them on DMT's YouTube and SoundCloud channels. My goal for this show was to look outside of the US and UK verticals, so there'll be a lot of discussions around international markets and also quite a bit of focus on the independent sector. As for Medium 2014, I once again really enjoyed the conference, it was my fifth year. Certainly it's had to adapt to a decreasing number of delegates over the last few years, and for example this year the main conference hall was smaller than usual, but that also meant that it was always packed and there was a stronger connection between the audience and the delegates. Also, I've heard from lots of people that were uh, in Cannes this year, uh, both uh, during and after the conference, that they've done some really good business out there and uh, had some great meetings. So that's certainly good news for the event. And uh, let's start uh, this week's medium recap with my catch up with Charles Caldas, CEO at Merlin, talking about the organization's success in representing the independent sector worldwide and the international markets showing the most activity for them. So uh, Merlin has uh, had great success in the last few years consolidating uh, and representing the independent sector worldwide, especially when it comes to, uh, you know, negotiating with streaming services. And so, and in a way, maybe that has also helped the independents uh, achieve the, the great success that we had on those platforms, claiming, you know, uh, such, a, such a huge percentage of streams uh, compared to the, to the overall market share, really. Yeah. Look, I think, you know, from a Merlin perspective, I would hope that we've certainly facilitated a lot of success for independents, that we've opened the opportunity for them to perform on these platforms. The one thing that's become clear to us is the more digital the market gets, the better it is for independence. You know, the, the old world music market was di dictated by financial power. So the labels that had the most ability to purchase retail space and to purchase advertising and to purchase marketing programs would always get to the front of the line. Yeah. I think the great thing that streaming platforms have uh, created is a much more open platform by which people can get to music. And if you can combine those vast platforms with the bundling of those platforms into Facebook, the ability to, to share and discover music in a much more direct way has certainly contributed to the success of independence. You know, we saw, a, we saw a, a survey in the UK this year where the, uh, the official charts company looked at the performance of independence in the charts over the last 10 years. And the last three years have been three of the most successful years ever for independence in the UK charts. I think there's a number of dynamics at play here. It's the, the digital market's been good for independence. The, um, the fact that there, there's less of these shop windows to walk through for consumers mean you can discover more broadly and you can, and, and you can uh, consume more broadly in, in a much more, more simple way. But it's also an investment thing, I think. You know, the major labels have been consolidating. The business, uh, physical business is, is tough. The majors are shrinking, but the independents are growing. Independent, you know, major labels have in a lot of cases stopped investing in domestic repertoire that's not sung in English. Uh, independence of filling that space. So if you look at markets like Spain and Italy, you know, independent labels are really starting to drive the growth in the market. Absolutely. And let's talk about uh, uh, you know, the international markets as well, because that's, uh, that's an area that I'm really interested in. And if we look at uh, the worldwide picture, you know, where are you seeing the most activity when it comes to Merlin? Are you seeing uh, territories that maybe have emerged over the last couple of years that you wouldn't have expected beforehand? Yeah, well, I mean, I think the big surprise for everybody is obviously the Nordic territories in the wake of the Spotify launch and the, the levels of adoption of streaming in, that, in those markets is extraordinary. We have to remember those markets also never really had a streaming 
uh, a dominant, sorry, they never had a dominant download culture. So yeah. they've kind of gone from physical to piracy to streaming. So there's, you know, and we certainly see these different dynamics play out culturally and depending on the consumption mode in, in, in different markets. Yeah. I think the interesting thing for me is, is both the way that we're seeing individual markets develop and, you know, and the growth is pretty consistent in terms of where these streaming platforms are actually available locally. The dynamic I'm really interested in at the moment is the, the fact that, you know, in some ways the global marketplace for locally produced music seems to be becoming more of a reality. So we had a meeting, for example, this morning with a, an Italian label we represent. In the streaming platforms, the their number one revenue, stream, uh, revenue source is the USA. Even though they're working in Italy with, 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 with Italian repertoire, you know, and I think that's a dance music thing. It's about the fact that, you know, that whole EDM thing's taking off in America, that the, the web facilitates discovery of that music from, from wherever it is, is, is really interesting. And I think that the, you know, so we're not only unbundling traditional retail, but we're unbundling or un, un, unwinding all of those territorial boundaries in terms of where music's consumed, which is really exciting. Yeah. And you provide a whole suite of services as well. I mean, you've just launched a new dashboard uh, on Merlin. So what is that all about and how does that help your members? Well, I think one of the responsibilities we feel for the labels we represent is to help them understand the changing market dynamics. Yeah. So the, the, there's always been a pattern that we've seen, for example, when a streaming service comes into a market, there's a lot of fear and you know, apprehension about, is it going to kill the physical market? Is it going to kill downloads? You know, the sky's falling down, we don't know what it is. But we're now having done this over several territories and several services, there's almost a pattern that emerges in terms of what happens when a, you know, a new market opens up to streaming, what are the adoption patterns, what are the signs that we look for in terms of growth. So the dashboard is in part so we can start sharing some of that information with our members. And in part, it's just about the fact that you have to be really fast in the, in the digital market. So reporting and payment and, and, and flowing through the, the information of what's actually happening on the platforms really quickly requires efficiency. So for us, it's a tool, it's sort of a business tool that, that's been built really to maximize the efficiency of the way we interact with our members. But I think underneath that, it's also hopefully going to be a tool by which they can better understand how the market evolves, what the measures are, and, and what they can learn from one market to another. And we continue with my chat with Mandar Thakur, CEO of Times Music. We chat about the state of the recorded music industry in India, take a look at some of the most prominent labels in the country, and the streaming services that are available. And uh, talking about this, the state of the recorded uh, music industry, uh, is, are the models that are uh, you know, applied in India uh, essentially very similar to the ones that we have uh, uh, here, you know, in, in, in the UK or in the US, as far as uh, licensing, as far as uh, um, record sales, uh, royalties, and, and all those uh, sort of host of issues. I think the models are pretty much similar, give or take a little bit. But what could be different is the structure of the industry and the structure of copyright, uh, you know, of, of the financial end of the copyright monetization process. So let me sort of take a step back. Um, in terms of business model, yeah, I mean. If you got you got the CD sales that are like anywhere else, you've got downloads and you've got streaming. And and as usual, you know, whilst the streaming businesses, like I said on yesterday's panel, you know, all the streaming guys go around talking about, oh, we're building great social media, we're building fan following, we're building blah, 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 and wait for the pennies to drop. Fact of the matter is, when you look at the rest of the world, which is outside of the US, UK, and Europe, uh, and particularly South Asia and that diaspora, you will realize that those countries musically are about the song, not about the artist. Because of a large inbuilt film culture, a large hundred year old musical heritage, markets like India, uh, music and movies are one and the same. Every movie is a musical. So there is no real artist out there. There is a director who knows what song he wants. Music composer composes it to a brief. Uh, it's all sort of work for hire. So it's, it's a created track, like an advertisement jingle. Um, in that sort of a situation, all you're talking about is plays because you know and and that's uh, you know so those bits and pieces like that differ in an Indian business scenario um, now when it comes to copyright uh, that's a whole different ball game for the longest time I always said you know I mean copyright was considered the right to copy uh, as opposed to the right to protect and exploit it um, and uh, 
Last year, uh, the industry got together with music composers. The government stepped in and a brand new spanking copyright law got refurbished, which finally legally recognized mechanicals. Um, so there is an interim sort of rate that we've agreed with the, the music publishers and you know, the record industry and the composers, and that sort of rate goes on for mechanicals. Um, there, there's a you know, fully functional copyright, uh, sorry, performance collection society playing on, which will soon be administering mechanicals. So, you know, bits and pieces from, from a new IP-based structure that's all coming together now. Um, in terms of marketing, sales, exploitation, I think those lines are pretty much similar. And the, looking at the landscape, you're talking about being an independent uh, uh, label, essentially. You know, how do you see, uh, what, what's the landscape like in terms of majors? Are the majors present in India? And what is their market share, essentially? Oh, well, okay, yeah. I mean, look, the majors are all present in India. They have been present since the last um, close to 40 years, 50 years, uh, perhaps more, in different shapes and forms, licensees, holding companies, back to licensing. Um, so structurally, there are the international majors and then there are the local majors, right? So we are sort of like a, a but we, you know, we, we operate independent. We, we, we're not baggaged and with the, with the largeness of a corporation. Our core company is probably bigger than most of the majors, but we are allowed, because we're in a new business, we are allowed to uh, pretty much chart our own course globally that way. Um, I think structurally speaking, it's a, I think it's like a, perhaps, and you know, give or take a few million. This is a US 260 or 270 million uh, business, um, out of which repertoire wise, local repertoire is pre the predominant repertoire. I mean, we've just got, you know, that's one of the things about India, it's all homogeneously produced local repertoire, because we've got a far bigger musical heritage than the rest of the world. So local repertoire rules, out of which 75% are Bollywood film musicals, and then the rest is non-film. Now, on the physical market, um, out of the 100%, only 1.5% is international music, right? And it's remained, uh, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, only 5% is international music. On mobile music, which is Ringback Tones, IVR-based mobile radio, it's only 1.5%. And that has got to do with the fact that it's not a smartphone-based system. Very, you know, the lowest strata of society also uses that, and that's, they don't, I mean, they don't consume international music, right? Um, but when it comes to streaming and when it comes to iTunes, it's a different picture. I would estimate an iTunes to have perhaps a 26% share of international music only because of the profile of the customer who buys an iPhone, it's expensive and upwardly mobile. And when it comes to streaming services, a newer picture emerges because now people have choice, they can search on a larger screen, most of the catalogs are available, so all other forms of music come up. So the percentages keep uh, keep sort of changing. Now, um, in terms of splits between digital and physical, most Indian record labels will be at a at an average, maybe a weighted average median of seven between 70 and 75 percent as digital income. So we are sort of far ahead of though, but that digital income includes mobile income, which is a larger chunk, right? Um, and in terms of structure, T-Series, which owns a large chunk of Bollywood repertoire, is the leading music company out of India, um, which is followed by Sarigama, which is pretty much does catalog management. It's a 100-year-old company, ex-EMI licensee. Um, so they, they size-wise, they're sort of number two, uh, but not very active on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and number three is Sony Music, uh, which is as good as a, lo a, a local major. I mean, they're like a 360 company. They're involved in Bollywood, regional music. I mean, it's, it's fairly large, right? Uh, and after that, then there is a fourth layer, which includes people like us. So that would be us, uh, Universal EMI. Universal EMI would be a little above us in terms of revenue, and then there is us at a sort of, and that I think is, composes the sort of top five labels out of India. And then there are the smaller labels like Tips, Venus, and, and these labels have been very big, but you know, the business has turned more to film production, uh, and the music business is sort of, uh, you know, they've not gone ahead acquiring a lot, so they've sort of uh, slipped down onto it. So that that is the gradation structure. You know? That's, yeah. And so you're talking about you know traditional methods of uh, of marketing. We talked about uh, the importance of mobile uh, for accessing uh, for ringtones as well, uh, and of course the fact that uh, uh, not that many people have smartphones yet also affects the adoption of streaming services. But there are some streaming services in India. So so what are the bigger ones? 
the big, the number one streaming service is Ghana.com, which is incidentally owned by our parent company. Um, then the second one now is a service called Savan. Uh, the original number one was Dingana.com, which uh, sort of had some cash investor problems and they're sort of on hold at the moment, I believe. Uh, so that sort of leveraged Ghana up. Ghana was the original number one, you know, a year back. And Savan at number two. Then there are other services like the Nokia OV store, which is very big in India. Yeah, I'm probably one of the few, yes. Um, and, and then there are the sort of Indian um, businesses streaming and download that either work with other aggregators, perhaps, uh, you know, the iTunes, the Amazons, the Netflixes. These are things like Raga.com, um, iMusti. These are based out of US, um, but catering to a fairly uh, large Indian diaspora. So a clux of these are the local homegrown music services. Of course, there is iTunes that's present. Um, and, and YouTube is huge in India, like uh, huge is like an understatement and they're growing in leaps and bounds. So I think um, uh, pretty much this coming year, you may have the entry of the global sort of streaming service coming in, uh, you know, perhaps some point, some point this year. And that I believe will sort of kickstart a war because India is about war. Any industry, you know, you look at the telecom industry, you look at Coke, Pepsi, you look at MTV, Channel V. Um, the country is fairly voracious in its appetite. Um, the peculiarity of India is that it skips, uh, skips uh, technology. So, you know, if, if, if you go back, the pager never, never even got born in India. And people jumped off to mobiles. And when mobiles started getting big, the smartphone revolution took off. You know, so it's a, it's a generation skipping uh, sort of country out there. And back to the UK, I catch up with Mel Brown from Impressive PR, one of the most prominent music PR agencies in the country. We discuss the most important media outlets in the UK for music, the importance of PR agencies going out there and discovering new bands that are doing some A&R themselves, and the continued rise of independent music in the UK. So, uh, talking about uh, the way PR has evolved uh, over the last uh, five years or so, there's been a bit of a sea change in how really uh, uh, everything works. You know, there's a lot of traditional media stuff still going on. But uh, there's, there's been definitely a shift uh, towards digital, which has really changed the way you do business, right? Yeah, that's correct. Although in the UK, I think we're quite different to other territories, especially America, in that we still have the majority of the print uh, publications that we have done forever. Um, over the last kind of, I suppose, 10 years, really, we've only seen about three or four major publications close. Um, so we still are print driven. Online is becoming more and more important. And there's some key websites that you have to kind of get on. And also what's happened is the magazines that are traditionally print, their counterpart online sites have been, become more successful and, you know, Coming more successful than the magazines. Unfortunately, I don't think the industry has shifted necessarily because when we're doing PR, the record labels and management still want to see the print. Right. So there's still a little work, bit of work to be done there. Absolutely. Um, but yes, of course, you can't uh, dismiss the statistics for the key online sites, you know, and also the demographic uh, is obviously a lot younger. For, for the websites. It's, uh, you mentioned A&R and I want to pick up on that because uh, uh, you know you uh, kind of act as an A&R in a sense because you have you get so many submissions by bands that you're talking about independent acts uh, that uh, want to be represented by you and so uh, how much time do you spend uh, listening to new bands and, and your team? Oh my god a lot a lot and in fact uh, my company was is 19 and a half years old now even from the very start, I think I was probably one of the first PRs to actually be A&R and PR because I, that's how I found Muse and Coldplay. Like, they were totally unsigned when I started working with them. You know, Muse had, had, was just in the process of signing. Coldplay hadn't signed at all. So even back then, it was absolutely crucial, and that's continued. I would say I find probably, and I represent 70% of my roster is music that I've found. So being proactive in finding. So I go to South by Southwest every year. I go to CMJ in New York every year. Um, and they're great places to find new talent. And obviously in the UK, we, we have the Great Escape, yeah. which is 
fantastic and it's grown and grown and grown and I, I think that that's fan- brilliant because it also brings overseas acts yeah it's not just about UK talent. And I think it's a mini South by Southwest. Yeah. And the independent music in, in uh, scene in the UK has really uh, become even healthier, I think, over the last few years. It's, it's just it's so strong. And, uh, you know, do you see that trend continue? A hundred percent. It's interesting because I had a conversation with a radio plugger that I've hired in uh, for one of my projects only this week. And I actually had a conversation with him and said, does, this ma- does it matter from Radio One's perspective that the artist is not signed to a major label or a big independent and he's a piv- he's a big big plugger a great plugger who looks after one republic the script ollie Murs, very successful uk acts and he said no the music just has to be good and there has to be kind of an maybe a story it's not even about stats for radio on now yeah. so so no i mean i think you know obviously to be a success it is a cumulative thing. All your ducks need to be lined up and it's a piece of a jigsaw puzzle and there's a little bit of luck involved to become successful as an artist. But no, I mean, I, you know, I love hearing new music and breaking new, new bands. And the startups were out in force at Medium this year, especially thanks to the Medium Lab competition. And I caught up with Bora Selig from Jukli. And so, you know, let's talk about Jukli. First of all, let's introduce the company to all, all the viewers and listeners out there. Sure. Jukli is a matchmaker for concerts and friends. Uh, when you sign up with it, we learn what you're listening to, what you like, what your friends are listening to, and what they like. And we match you with upcoming concerts, and we match you with friends to go with, even friends of friends to go with, uh, to create an open social conversation around live music and bring people together. So uh, going from one city to ten cities, so how, how did that process work? And, and uh, uh, how are you finding users are reacting to Jukli? Because, you know, you showed me in the prep, uh, uh, you know, a very good example, which is a, a list of people that are, if you just uh, do a search, actually, if, you, if you're back home, if you uh, type uh, uh, concert and alone or gig and alone, and you're going to find loads of people that are tweeting about going to gig alone or thinking about whether they should go to a gig alone or not. So, uh, you know, how, how do you find people are reacting to the opportunity of having the service now? Yeah, so we actually haven't fully unleashed the power of what we wanted to build. Um, we changed course a little bit uh, in the beginning you know where we wanted to go to is you know create the social environment for an open conversation for people finding each other and going yeah. going to concerts together um, it took us a while we just submitted a release to the app store now um, you know so there there are multiple things people are using Jubilee for first of all they love the design of the app thanks to Andrew and his you know Kickstarter design awesomeness that you know we're getting a lot of accolades um, so first we started getting all the designers downloading the app and playing with it. oh this is great you know uh, so we did the iOS 7 version of it which is like also so people really liked you know the way it was built and then we started breaking into different areas uh, our strongest markets are electronic music and indie music so like we start with the startup people and the designer type people hipsters who listen to a lot of indie music and then we started making all these deals with the clubs and the promoters who promote electronic music so we started getting like the teenagers 18 to 24 which I call real people not like the startup people so that's when you start seeing the actual potential of your real product once that you know it's you see the you observe it outside of uh, uh, the tech crowd and uh, now you know we're observing uh, patterns in those cities and how people are using Jukli, you know how they engage with their friends and uh, we're learning lessons and we call it you know nailing the playbook for cities we haven't nailed yet I think we're 80% there some of our cities like we're very strong in New York because that's where we built up for a few months and then we're strong in LA Chicago San Francisco uh, Miami Vegas um, we're building up in Seattle, Portland, Denver, um, and then we want to launch in 10 other cities. Um, and of course, uh, you know, there needs to be a formula. You know, um, we launched in 10 cities because, uh, you know, Apple uh, was going to feature us and they wouldn't feature you if you're only one city. Sure. And we wanted to take advantage of that, of course, and uh, we kind of jumped in, you know, got a bunch, bunch of downloads, got our 50 minutes of fame there. and. Uh, and now you know we're like we have to blossom the cities into into you know something special and we're getting there you know, these communities are really important you know because it's a social product it's a friend you, you need to see your friends and friends of friends and the people get recommended to you in your network and it doesn't need it cannot feel empty we cannot afford 
the app to feel empty. So actually, I'm a little bit nervous now because the next release that's going to be in the app stores probably sometime next week uh, is completely open. You see, actually, you'll, you'll be able to see the people and talk to the people. Um, so far, it's, it was kind of still closed, so yeah. it was a little bit more protected in that sense. But right now, like, it's going to be more transparent what's happening in the city. Like, you're going to go onto the show and see, like, how many people are actually engaging with it and who can you hit, who can you send a message to. So it'll be interesting. I'm excited for it. A little bit nervous also. <laughs> and from a startup to a very established company, I chat with uh, Denis Ladigayeri, CEO of Belief Digital, on the company's expansion over the past few years, the digital market in Russia, the rise of streaming services, and how that impacts their business. So the company has grown incredibly in the last uh, so seven years, uh, and you now have offices all over the world. Uh, so first of all, uh, let's talk a little bit about that process of uh, expanding a music company and making it uh, uh, so incredibly successful. Uh, even whilst there's so many people that are you know struggling in this industry so what's the key to to believe success so far have the secret recipe <laughs> <laughs> it's um well i, I think it's a first uh mix of making sure that when you uh talk to clients it's uh, our clients basically trust them and they trust them because we are prompt with them we provide them services yeah. uh we basically we do uh we do what we say um to them so it's, i think that's basically been been the basis and then oh. for companies like us i think it's either you're international or you're not um, I mean, we see, uh, I was looking at our stats in the UK a couple of days ago, uh, for all of our uh, UK labels, UK sales represent 25% of our revenues, 75% comes from Germany, the US, the rest of Europe. So if you don't have offices in those countries to be able to support an artist when something happens, then you're not doing your job properly. Yeah. So why for us, international expansion was absolutely key. Uh, what we see is, I mean, Europe has historically always been our focus and remains our focus because for all of our clients, it's the number one market uh, for UK labels. They sell music uh, pretty much uh, in, the, in, the, in the vicinity, I would say, uh, Scandinavia, France, Germany, Italy, yeah. and then maybe Australia, the US. So uh, Europe remains a very strong focus. And then uh, we have opened about 20 new offices around the world last year. Yeah. Um, essentially, as uh, Apple expanded into this market, this created a new opportunities for us. Yeah. Uh, and what we've seen is some very strong, fantastic markets, uh, Russia, Turkey, um, especially some of for of our European uh, labels. In terms of volumes, uh, Russia, for example, has become our fifth largest territory worldwide. Wow. Of very significant volumes. And we, that's incredible because it's a very challenging territory for most, uh, most rice holders, right? We, we now have like five people in Moscow uh, working for Believe Digital. When we spoke about opening an office there a uh, year and a half ago, everybody was tell telling us, you guys are crazy crazy uh, uh, champion of the world for piracy and I mean what we see is um, always the same story if you're able to provide good service uh, and which is a, a country where Apple is very strong where people buy iPhone 600 700 dollars when it comes to buying an album for 499 599 then then people are happy when the solution is here and we seem in mean, we've, we've done some with, with some top local Russian artists with um, Zemfira which is our top artist there Last album was released about a month ago. I was looking yesterday. We've sold 48,000 copies on iTunes digitally wow. uh, in a month and a half. That's so awesome. it's, it's, it's great. Uh, some of these very good surprises in some of these territories. And in Russia, of course, you know, talking about uh, iTunes, and is that like still like, you know, the, by far the main driver of, of sales? Um, uh, Google Music, is so, uh, which launched a little bit later, uh, has seen great success, uh, very strong uh, early numbers. Um, and, and we see it's still a market where uh, ring back on providers uh, locally are, are still very strong, uh, but the structure is clearly evolving like many of those markets. Yeah, yeah sure. Uh, I mean, what, what we see, interestingly, the conclusion we've come to is, and I've spent a lot of my time traveling around, is this base, you almost have three market phases. Is one where dominated by wireless carriers for three, four years. And then usually Apple comes in, takes 50, 60, 70, 80% of the market. 
and last three, two, three, four years. And then the last phase of the market, um, uh, Deezer, Spotify, RDO come in the market and then uh, start gaining some market share. So it, we really see this all around the world. So which means you need to have the understanding of local market to be able to basically do your job properly as a distributor. Sure. And, uh, you know, we're looking at in the UK and in the US, uh, the 2013 has been reported of the first year where digital track sales uh, started declining. And uh, of course, the streaming is growing dramatically. So uh, does that shift uh, sort of your revenue model in a sense, uh, or is essentially just a substitution of the same? Tough question. <laughs> it's a very tough question. What what we see is um, the, the the way we we look at it is in two ways. One, it's uh, basically what's the size of a pie in yeah. the market, and then how is that pie being divided on download market on streaming market. Uh, the good news right now, what we're seeing is that. When the pie is divided, it's actually more favorable uh, in streaming markets for our clients because streaming tend you tend to have a higher level di um, of discovery, yeah. and typically um, in a market uh, like France, for example, where we have an average market share of about seven percent on streaming services, our market share is almost ten percent, wow. so uh, almost forty percent higher because people are discovering more music, it's easier, you don't have to buy a track. Uh, so it, it's actually favorable. Uh, what we are seeing uh, also on the other end though, in the switch, um, we think there's the question as to whether the switch to streaming in the short term, actually for the overall pie, um, creates value or um, destroys value. And I think the answer there is very different. Yeah. Uh, in a market where Obviously, the download market has not built. When streaming picks up early, uh, it, it creates additional value. In some markets like France, what we're seeing is um, once you start having a customer switch from download to streaming, you are actually destroying value in the short term. Um, so it's a mix, I, I would say, a little bit too early to tell. And it really depends a lot on, on the services, uh, on, on the growth of the services of Deezer, Spotify in each territory. But I would say as a, as a whole, in the medium term, it clearly has an impact of flattening out the growth on the market. Yeah. Uh, I mean, what we see clearly... We see the trend in the U.S. Uh, with uh, declining track downloads last year. We see the trend in the U.K. We see the trend in France, which are uh, all um, top five uh, worldwide markets. So it's, I would say uh, it probably has a negative impact short term on growth um, yeah. and then varying by market. Yeah, sure. And, and it was a pleasure to catch up with Martin Frascona from Frascona Law. And we talk about the law firm's international focus and the need to adapt to each territory's particular market needs. Yeah. Um, everybody kind of has different uh, backgrounds in, in, in the legal world. Mine is with uh, working with international artists. So currently my, my clientele spans uh, 34 countries and six continents. So it's a very interesting kind of mix and luckily not something that a lot of uh, uh, attorneys kind of focus on international aspects. Absolutely. And that's something I try to do on the show as well. I try and involve as many people from uh, uh, different continents as possible because usually the conversation is always based around UK, US maybe Europe, uh, and nobody ever thinks about Asia or South America. There's, there's other things out there, that's yeah. for sure. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so you're talking about 34 countries, so uh, I, I'm really interested in the international outlook of the music industry. So where are you seeing the most inquiries coming from? Is there a particular uh, area of the world where you're seeing you know, a, a, a buzz about the industry there, about what's happening? Uh, loaded questions. Let me... Uh you know, I've got an artist right now that um, she's done very well in the States and she's she's based in the States. Most of my clients are outside of North America, um, but she's done very well on YouTube and she has over 300 million hits on her YouTube channel. Um, obviously, that has gotten her label attention within the States now, but most of her analytics are coming from Indonesia and Malaysia. Um, and it's strange to kind of watch that market take off. Now, from a sales perspective, maybe not the most attractive. From a talent perspective, 
very, very talented in those areas. Um, so it kind of depends on what you're looking for. The, the, the German market uh, has kind of been an area of attention with U.S. labels lately. Um, Switzerland is a big area. Austria has been a big uh, area. Sweden is now getting on the map. And it's interesting because, as you know, genres change from market to market, from country to country. So whatever you're identifying as pop within the U.S., that may not be what is classified as pop within Sweden. So it's really interesting, um, you know, for artists, the example I typically give, if you're an artist in San Diego and your music may not be selling in San Diego, my question is, why are you trying to plug it in San Diego? The, the appropriate market, the appropriate sales market may be Dublin, Ireland. So the X factor is, how do you move your product to Ireland? How do you generate a sustainable career in Ireland? And that's where you get into kind of the international aspects of what I do. Uh, looking at the formats as well, you were talking about Germany and, and uh, you know, Indonesia and uh, uh, different parts of the world have really completely different approaches. The stats are sure. different from territory to ter territory when it comes to physical sales, digital adoption, streaming adoption. Their methods of consumption like very widely. So, so do you have to adapt uh, each artist strategy to the territory where that they're targeting? when it comes to also generating revenues from recorded music sales? Uh, yeah, again, I think it goes back to the type artist and what is their strategy. So right. if they're trying to acquire a major label, obviously you've got an end game in mind there. So how are you trying to how are you trying to generate visibility to get them on the label map in, in a particular territory? But you're right, all the trends are completely different. So um, I did a, an article for, for Meetem, this was maybe six months ago, talking about the Brazilian uh, music trends and the uh, trends in Argentina. Completely different. In one market, uh, you know, artists are found on YouTube. On the other one, they're found on local radio. Um, so you've got this total paradigm shift. If you really have got to understand the market that you're trying to go into, which brings a lot of legal problems as well or legal things you must maneuver um, another example I usually give when I do lectures is you think of just a simple Twitter account yeah. all bands have a Twitter account all bands have a Facebook account you cross over intellectual property borders within seconds the second you take a picture on your Twitter account and you send it off you may have four or five people in different countries retweet that you've jumped over four or five different legal boundaries and four or five different IP laws and you've got to understand what you're dealing with because a lot of times if your end goal is to sign with a label the label wants to acquire the intellectual property as part of their business model so they want to make sure that they can monetize all social media aspects well when they do that there's typically a, a uh, monetary amount that they'll kind of put forward when they offer uh, to a band so they'll pay X amount to acquire the social media when you're dealing with that and you're a band you've got to understand who owns that social media the second a label puts down money and says we'd like to buy that you don't want to then be discussed within the band of hey guys how are we going to divide this money and I see a lot of those problems unfortunately take place but then you just add another layer to it when you're jumping over international borders depending on what are you doing with your social media as well so it's a you said fun I'd say fun sometimes issue to deal with um, but yeah I, I enjoy what I do it I really do and it's always fun to catch up with the Pledge Music team. And this time it was Benji Rogers and Paul Barton. We talk about the evolution of the company over the past 12 months, uh, artists coming back to the platform for a second or third campaign, the community around Pledge and much more. Uh, Pledge has grown a lot uh, uh, over, the, over the past year. Uh, on the product front, let's start with that. Uh, what's, what's been happening? Sure. So we're actually in the midst of a, of a rebuild of the entire platform, um, basically from the ground up. And it's um, going to focus, it's going to be a lot more artist centric. One of, the feed, one of the bits of feedback that we've been consistently getting from artists is we love what Pledge does, but we kind of, it's very heavily Pledge branded. Yeah. And so the new platform is going to have a lot of, you know, new uh, types of design features that are going to be more about featuring the artist brand and their thing, while still retaining all the benefits of the platform itself. But, you know, platform-wise, feature-wise, you know, we've been getting a lot more into the chart eligibility needs of a lot of our artists. We're getting a lot more into fulfillment and manufacturing, because that's a big thing that artists yeah. have wanted. And led, I think, in large part by the UK team and Paul and his team in particular, is that the label integrations, the, the types of campaigns that we're doing, we've had to adapt what the platform does for them. Yeah. And we've been absolutely open to doing the maximum we can while still retaining the fan experience and make sure that that keeps important. So, and looking at how the uh, 
you know, artists are, are using Pledge. Of course, you know, you're coming uh, to, to, to the point where artists are, are using Pledge for the second time around, or maybe even third, who knows. Uh, but So uh, how is their approach evolving for artists that have used it before and are coming back to the platform? Do you, do you find that they're refining their approach, they're refining the way that they present their and, and they conduct their campaigns? They're actually getting better at it, I find, because uh, uh, so what happens when you launch a second campaign, the first pledges are auto-notified about the new one as it goes live. So there's a big kind of initial burst. And one of my favorite ones is, is you know, watching someone like Matthew Mayfield, who's on three campaigns, his first campaigns, you know, under 200 pledges, his second campaign, over 500 pledges, his third, close to 1,000. So you see it growing. And I mean, you know, bands like Hawkeyes, who did their first campaign and second campaign, you can see that there's a, yeah, there's a progression because now the existing fans are ready and they're actually excited about it. And in the best possible scenario, an artist says, listen, I'm thinking of doing another one. What do you guys want to see? The fans will give their feedback. And that's another thing. One more thing to add that we've added to in the last year, which I mentioned is, We've now got a survey functionality within the updates, so an artist can upload five different versions of the artwork, fans can vote for which one they like, upload the entire album, fans can choose sequences, so they're able to interact a lot more. And so when an, a second campaign launches, we're like, hey, by the way, you should offer this this technique, you should offer this one. Yeah. And looking at uh, the community around Pledge as well, I think last year when we were talking, you were actually saying that the majority of people that Pledge uh, have pledged for a very particular artist and they may not have uh, necessarily pledged for other campaigns on the platform. How has that evolved over the last year? Have you seen more people come back to pledge purely because they're used to the platform now and invest in artists they might not necessarily have a personal connection with? It's changed a huge amount. Um, what we noticed was is we started to get a, a weekly report and we were noticing that if we put in a certain type of artist that they could they could expect between 30 and 40 percent of their first week's pre-orders to come from existing pledge users and we now have a recommendation engine built in and the new the new version of the site will also have um will surface recommendations in different ways because ultimately fans are saying we want this experience with more bands and our job now and particularly in the a and r role and which paul can speak to more is to go get them the bands that they want to see and it's not just the established big bands it's also they want to discover new bands and not just listen to them but help them out or you know be a part of it and uh that's the most exciting thing you know we saw on one campaign, 48% of this artist's pledges came from within our system. That's 48%, that's a huge amount. And that's just fans, you know, we're all music fans. We all want the same thing. We just, you know, we found a way to connect them all. And when similar artists launch at the same time, you see this cross-pollination of pledging going on. So artists who know each other sharing in updates and going back and forth. It's so quite addictive as well. Like it's, Absolutely. I think, I think our customer base also has, you know, we've got a lot of vinyl junkies, yep. we've got a lot of t-shirt junkies, we've got a lot of screen print poster junkies. So I think our new search engine, which you're able to search yep. via product rather than as well as via artist and genre, I think that will really help because, I, you know, our customers want the box sets. You know, what what what's, what sort of box sets do we have on offer on Pledge Music? And they can bring up the whole host of artists that are running box sets or running vinyl or running t-shirts. And, you know, so customers that want to be able to spread out their sort of search into those areas. So yeah, it's yeah. exciting. And let's move to Brazil as I interviewed uh, Rock in Rio's uh, CEO, Luiz Justo, on the festival's history, the importance of brands, the plans for a Las Vegas edition, and the recent partnership with SFX. Meet you. So first of all, you know, can you introduce Rock in Rio to viewers or listeners that might not have a be that familiar with it. All right, Rock in Rio, uh, we are completing 30 years of festival next year. So we're beginning back 1985 in Rio de Janeiro. That's why the name of the festival is Rock in Rio. And more than rock as an attitude, than the, the music style, because in Rock in Rio, you see a lot of different music styles. Yeah. There are always more than a hundred different artists in every edition. And uh, back that in 1985, the project uh, was born in a way that Brazil, uh, you know, in the 80s was a very poor country. Now we are in a, in a very good ascension. But back on that time, you can imagine that a festival to bring all the main international celebrities to Brazil, uh, it costs a lot. And the price of tickets in Brazil back on that time was as like $8 uh, compared to 80, what was the usual price. So the way of 
of that that rock in Rio needs to be you know financially uh, feasible it needs to be huge in terms of audience so uh, it was not a, a, a megalomany of the founder that is Roberto a, a big Brazilian entrepreneur but we really need to be something big in the aspect of the audience so the very first edition was 1.3 million people wow. in 98, uh, 1985 with you know all the main artists like Queen with uh, Freddie Mercury that was a, a really amazing performance there but not also you know all the the, 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 the heavy metal sets as Idol Made in ACDC Black Saba back that days and pop artists so it was a really you know unique for Brazil because it was the very very you know first festival that brings uh, the attention of the, the the world of entertainment to Brazil and uh, as I was say it needs to be huge uh, in terms of audience and also uh, it needs to be a, a platform to sponsorships and brands uh, to, to make it happen so sure. in the very first edition uh, Brahma, that was a, a local Brazilian beer, uh, invested two, uh, 25 million dollars in sponsorship, and Rock and Rio became the campaign of of the beer. Or actually, was the launch of a new beer as they want to rejuvenate the brand. And uh, it was a platform that was one year talking about Rock and Rio and the brands involved in Rock and Rio. Yeah. And since then, that's the DNA of Rock and Rio. So Rock and Rio, more than only a music festival, is a platform that communicates uh, using a lot of media partners. So every country that we are in nowadays, uh, we are in Brazil, Lisbon, uh, Spain, and we are going to US having our very first edition in Vegas 2015. Awesome. It will be May 2015. Right. And we, we, we are always with a lot of, of sponsors and brands involved and talking uh, about, you know, Rock and Rio and brands in press during the whole year. So usually uh, Rock and Rio is every other year in yeah. the country that we, we, we are. So uh, the last edition was in, in Rio in 2013. We have, uh, you know, 2015, 17 in Brazil. Uh, Lisbon, we have now in May 2014, uh, we have an edition in, in Lisbon that a lot of headliners already confirmed. So you can check it out in rockandrio.com or, or on Facebook, etc. And, uh, and we are going to Vegas. So we are beginning 2015 in US. And it will be, you know, every other year in Las Vegas as well. Yeah. And the U.S. is an interesting market because uh, there are quite a few big established festivals. And so how, how do you position yourself in the States? You know, uh, uh, Rock in Rio is a very unique festival. Uh, first of all, uh, it's, uh, it's a really premium uh, concept of festival. So uh, uh, if you go there, first we build, a, uh, we, we actually build a city. So we call our venue as a rock, uh, city of rock. In every country that we go, there is a special venue that is constructed to Rock in Rio with a lot of like premium uh, assets. So it's all artificial grass, uh, real toilets, not chemical toilets. And so very unique experience, experience that the audience and the brands can you know show up uh, in a very different way that 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 usual festivals yeah. position more a lifestyle <laughs> and, uh, and, and and <laughs> yeah and the, so and, and another thing as I said we are we have a lot of, of media partners involved so uh, we are starting next March already a campaign uh, to talk about rock and Rio and people will understand that that is a really different kind of, of, of experience that we offer to, to this audience. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. And looking at the, the US as well, you know, you, you recently uh, uh, started a, a quite a close partnership with uh, SFX uh, in the States. So uh, how did that come about and how is that affecting the way that you operate and helping perhaps the way that you operate? Yeah, uh, SFX, you know, Bob Silliman is, is also a big entrepreneur. So first of all, I think that Roberto, that is the entrepreneur, founder of Rock and Rio and Bob, has a lot of common of being a very creative and uh, very effective in the way they approach the market. So uh, more than, you know, SFX, it's, it, it's more focused on the DEGM market, but they, they we see, you know, together, uh, a possible collaboration of Rock and Rio expertise as Rock and Rio is really uh, unique in terms of the knowledge about communication and sponsorship. Just for you to know, uh, the last edition of Rock and Rio in Brazil in 2013, uh, we raised $52 million in sponsorship. And uh, that, that's, that is no any other festival or music show in the world that has that, that kind of, of uh, investment. And 
uh, uh, the brands return. So we are we are partnering always with the same brands for the whole, the, all the, the, the the editions. That what proves that that there is return on on their investment. So yeah. we really know how to uh, use our festival as a platform for brands that wants to be attached to music, and SFX wants also part of their, their experience to attach to their festivals. And on the other hand, we we think that there's a lot of synergies that we can uh, match together. Yeah, they they have huge EGM festivals as Tomorrowland, Tomorrow World. So there are a lot of synergies and that we can put our teams together to explore, not only for the US market, that is the, the big you know uh, project for 2015, but also expanding for other countries. And next, I chat with Scott Coyne, co-founder and VP of International at The Orchard, about how the company managed to thrive and expand internationally, as well as about its successful YouTube multi-channel network. You know, a, a company that was started back in uh, 1997. And so my, my first, quest, first question, I guess it's, it's a difficult question, but it's just asking as, as a, one of the few companies that from 1997 to today has managed to thrive, sort of uh, how, how have you succeeded while so many other companies have failed in this space? <laughs> um, I, how have we succeeded? I mean, again, that is a complex question to answer, but I think one of the things is we've kind of, baked into the DNA of the company that change is fundamental. Yeah. That I think a lot of companies over the past two decades, particularly in the media space, keep getting caught because they think they know what it is. So it was the traditional music companies, for instance, that didn't want to transition to digital downloads. Um, but then you see companies that came up in the early 2000s and then they started to say now we understand the business but it changed again it changed in the mid 2000s with you know uh, you know 2005 plus with uh, the social media you know myspace then and facebook and twitter and and then you come into the streaming you know ad supported services and subscription services like deezer spotify rdo now beats throw YouTube on top of it. And it's, it's an ever changing space. And we're, that's what we're used to. That's what we're expecting. We're expecting that whatever we do today will not be the same as what we do next year. Because early on in the company as well, you had a, there were like some big issues when it came to like physical distribution. The, the, you had some troubles with your like your stocking house as well. And so it's one of those yeah. one of those points where you know the company could have gone either way, right? Oh yeah, no. In in the very early days, because we never took any financing back in the '90s, it was an incredibly challenging landscape. And yeah, there were moments where we just didn't know how we were going to survive, um, but we did, and uh, ultimately we we we've now thrived. Um, in this space. Um, and so it's, it's not just understanding that the business is always changing, but also trying to look forward and anticipate where it's going to go. And even I would say, not just anticipate, but, but try and shape what that future is going to look like. Not just hoping we guess it right, but actually to build out those elements that people don't even know that they will be needing, but, yeah. but they will later. So, you know, the, the Orchard, uh, one of the, the really interesting parts of the business that's developed over the last few years is your MCN, uh, uh, you know, uh, multi-channel network that you developed uh, over, over a number of years. The company, of course, has, has taken its first steps in, in the video side of things. I think it was uh, circa 2008, 2009, you started like looking at monetization of, of, of YouTube videos. And so how did the evolution of that into a multi-channel network come about? Was it deliberate or did you just end up with a multi-channel network thanks to you know the various channels that, that, that you developed and then when the concept came into being of a multi-channel network you essentially were already there as, as a company well it, it it didn't start in 2008 it we actually had our first video department in 1999 wow. um, and it was run by a gentleman uh, called ron jarrett at the time and and he's still in film and we were just incredibly too early if i th if, if we were too early in music and you know in the mid 90s way too early for online video so we we tried it for a few years and then kind of parked it on the side we waited for you know uh devices bandwidth and consumers to be ready to relaunch in a meaningful way and when we did that it was always of the intention of you know 
as a distributor, we get lots of different types of content right. and from lots of different types of content providers. So some's music, some's television, films, uh, action sports videos. We, we and, and, and some are combined, um, you know, music with film. It didn't matter. We just knew that we wanted to provide those services in that space. And because of that, we've built up one of the largest multi-channel networks in the world and always coming in top 10 with YouTube. And I think last year we finished as number seven globally in YouTube partnerships. And let's jump to Malaysia, a country that I knew very little about prior to meet them. But here's a chance to learn a little bit more thanks to my chat with the head of the Recording Industry Association of Malaysia, Norman Abdul Halim. You know, uh, a pretty great booth here uh, for, for the Malaysian uh, presence uh, at uh, Meden. So how did you end up getting involved with Meden in the first place? Well, first of all, uh, I attended the market uh, sometime towards uh, uh, mid, around 2005, 2006 on my own personal yeah. capacity. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I've been, I was appointed as the chairman of uh, the Music Committee, uh, National Development Committee uh, in about two years ago, about a couple of years back. And uh, that was when actually I mooted the idea of actually having uh, our presence here yeah. to the Malaysian government. Uh, and on behalf of Recording Industry of Malaysia, we represent uh, about 300 record companies. Um, and we, we would like to see more activities happen outside of Malaysia, sure. especially promoting our music to uh, you know across uh, the globe. And uh, we've seen some uh, early day success of our artists making their own efforts in Taiwan, China, uh, in India, uh, UK, even the US. Yeah. So, um, you know, I think our presence here in Medem is actually very important, especially to actually um, continuously uh, build our presence in the global market space. Sure. Let's talk about uh, the uh, development of uh, digital music in Malaysia as well. So, uh, what kind of digital services do you have at the moment and what kind of opportunities do you see for growth there? Well, the big ones are uh, still very much dependent on uh, services provided by the tele telecommunications companies right. for the ringback tone business model. Uh, that contributes uh, roughly about uh, two-thirds of our income right now compared to physical sales. Um, and I would say that the, um, uh, the normal, all the other usual suspects like iTunes, Spotify, Deezer, they're all in Malaysia already. Yeah. Uh, I think a lot of record companies are seeing revenue from YouTube even. Yeah. So uh, I think that, that uh, generally what you see elsewhere, I mean, we have it in Malaysia. Uh, it's just that, that I think the Malaysian record companies, especially the artists, need to look into content that can travel. Right. So especially language is always an issue. Uh, and I think that uh, we encourage that we encourage to do more collaborations and partnerships. Absolutely. Uh, looking at the, the, the way that the industry is structured as well, do you have a big major label presence? Is it mostly independent labels that are local to, to, to Malaysia? How does it work? We have Universal, Warner, and, and Sony in, in, in Malaysia. They are part of the REM as well. They are yeah. also they sit in a council. Uh, but I must say that that uh, the 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 the, the um, contribution from the independent labels are getting more and more significant, um, especially in terms of exporting music. Right? For example, you know all these artists that I mentioned that actually have yeah. done some level of success uh, are actually signed to independent labels. So, uh, of course, you know, Yuna eventually signed to a subsidiary of, of Universal, but you know, she started off as her own independent label as well. So I think it's the effort made by these Malaysian artists and Malaysian labels and managers actually uh, try to open new uh, territories and new opportunities. Uh, whereas if you were signed to a major label, sometimes you get drowned in the priority list, you know. I mean, the thing is, the, uh, that's the reality. So uh, I think that, that in order to see more... Malaysian artists to travel or even composers or, 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 or performers, I would say that you know, it's, it's, it's actually very vi it's vital to see uh, a lot more effort made by the indies. Yeah. And here is my chat with Ken Hertz from Hertz, Liechtenstein and Young LLP. We talk first about big data and second about the Transform initiative that he helped shape it together with Will I Am and that launched in Europe at Medem. So looking at, uh, you know, uh, of course, uh, technology can be a fantastic enabler when you're looking at uh, artists that want to capitalize on the audience that they have. So big data is one of the subjects that you are uh, quite interested in. So looking at big data companies uh, uh, like, for example, Next Big Sound or Music Metric uh, in the UK, you know, do you feel like artists are making the most of these platforms yet? And uh, is there still a lot of understanding to be gained uh, when it comes to actually being able to interpret the data that comes from the analytics uh, of these sites? Okay, so the first let me let me let me dispel the first uh, issue, which is: Do I think artists 
uh, can gain a lot from working with metrics. Of course. In other words, if you're trying to market your music to a fan of this artist, then obviously knowing who are the fans of that artist could be very valuable to you. With respect to uh, what we can learn from the data, you know, I do believe that there is a big success story out there waiting to arrive um, where the uh, purveyors of data and th those companies that actually collect, analyze, retain data um, will be able to empower some kind of discovery recommendation technology which will be extraordinarily valuable not just to marketers of music but to consumers of music but then ultimately to marketers of everything and consumers of everything right because I do believe that um, lifestyle choices music motion pictures television books consumables of all kind tell us a great deal about you know, what you've done tells us, and what you like tells us a great deal about what you will do and what you will like. And so, whoever figures out how to crack the code in the data area, I mean, we're overwhelmed with data now, but nobody really seems to know what to do with it. I mean, the reason that big advertisers are migrating so reluctantly to digital, right, comparatively speaking, when you think of, when you look at the mind share versus the market share that, that uh, digital has in the advertising industry, most of that is because of how challenging it is to measure the ROI, to measure the results of the expenditure. The other problem is, is that you have this, this crazy reality, which is, you know, it used to be you would buy advertising and you would then pay for it based upon its reach, right? Well, no one's willing to pay an unlimited amount. And the problem with, uh, with digital advertising is that it has, in theory, an unlimited reach. You know, you put an ad on YouTube and 10 people could see it, Billions of people could see it, or millions of people could see it billions of times. How do you pay for that? And how do you measure the investment? And how do you determine how much you should invest in it? It's almost like what they've done is they've bridged this gap between advertisers and content creators, where the advertisers are the content creators. In other words, it used to be the content creators would take the risk of finding the audience, and then the size of the audience would determine how much they could sell their advertising for. Now. The advertisers create the content and they are taking the risk of finding the audience and then they have to measure internally what their investment was worth. But you can't predict how big the advertising, how successful the advertising itself is going to be in terms of its reach, let alone how successful it's going to be once it creates a reach on its audience, right? So for advertisers, it's a very complicated situation. I think, you know, the, the solution, to get back to your question, the solution is, is data. Right? In other words, we are going to find ways of predicting who is interested in what information, who is interested in what kind of content, who is interested in what kind of marketing message. And as soon as we can figure out how to translate that to people who want to spend money, it, it, we're going to see a lot of, uh, a, a really, I think, an explosion in the economic size of connectivity. It's just, you know, I think the, the, the biggest thing is now with all of these different services and entrepreneurs, applications, businesses, traditional, non-traditional, competing for our time and our energy and our attention, uh, it, we haven't yet reached the oversaturation point, but I imagine that we will soon. And then there'll be some kind of a shakeout where, you know, uh, you, know you and I are just not going to have time to do everything, to read our email to read our Facebook posts, to read our Twitter messages, to read you know, our various applications, to use our various applications. These are not time savers, they're time eaters. Um, and so you know, I, I don't know the point at which either someone figures out how to use data to save us time and make us more productive, or we use data to make choices amongst the various things that we want to do with our time. And uh, you are one of the uh, shapers of the uh, Transform um, uh, initiative that uh, uh, was subject of a, of, of a, of a panel here uh, at uh, Medium as well. So can you talk a little bit about uh, what it is and, and how, how it came to be? Okay, so Transform is an event that was created originally by Will I Am in Los Angeles to fund um, uh, his uh, college track center in East Los Angeles in Boyle Heights with Lorraine Jobs, Steve Jobs' widow 
who runs a, a fabulous organization called College Track, which takes at-risk kids and helps keep them in school, helps them succeed in school, helps them get into college, helps them stay in college, and helps them change their lives. Um, Will raised millions of dollars through a concert and a conference that he held in Los Angeles, and then he held it two years in a row, and then this year held the concert again and didn't do the conference, but, um, but the concept of Transform is to take our inner cities, take our communities, and take our at-risk kids and help them using science, technology, engineering, and math, uh, and, uh, and the arts, so what Will refers to as STEAM, uh, to make positive change in people's lives. Um, you know, I think, you know, it's fabulous what he's done. Uh, he spoke yesterday, he gave a keynote, and then afterwards we had a conversation about how uh, the music industry in particular uh, can uh, affect transformative change in the lives of kids, in the lives of communities, right? The idea of transform originally was transform yourself, transform your neighborhood, transform your community, transform your nation, transform your world. Yeah. Yeah, and, uh... and finally, here's an extract from my chat with Jordan Berliant from The Collective, talking about Linkin Park's involvement with Music for Relief. Yeah, uh, let's talk about a project that uh, you know, one, of the, uh, one of your bands has created that you've uh, been particularly proud of, that you've seen uh, over the last year or so. You know, what, what would you mention uh, to me? Well, one of the things that um, I'm particularly proud of um, is Lincoln Park's involvement with uh, Music for Relief, which is a charity that they founded in the aftermath of the 2004 Asian tsunamis. Um, in addition to um, having raised uh, millions and millions of dollars that have been um, allocated towards projects to help survivors of disasters on pretty much every continent of the planet, um, we've really focused uh, very diligently on uh, long-term uh, relief efforts in places like Haiti and places like Japan. And most recently, we held a uh, benefit concert in Los Angeles for the survivors of the recent typhoon in the Philippines. Um, and I'm very, very proud of, uh, you know, to be associated with guys like Lincoln Park, whose philanthropic efforts are as important to them as their success and their day job as musicians. And the fact of the matter is that they can combine those two interests to really move the dial and really help save people's lives. Um, and um, hopefully you'll, you'll all see the um, results of that effort uh, on television, because we did film it for television and um, it will start airing uh, within the next couple of weeks. So, um, we've already raised in excess of half a million dollars through those efforts and uh, hopefully the outreach via the uh, television show um, will help us raise even more money. Um, and, and again, uh, we partner with uh, non-government organizations who are on the ground uh, to provide a very specific um, uh, relief effort. Um, in, these, uh, in the aftermath of these disasters. And the other thing I'm very proud of the guys about is that they actually go to these places to see the results of what these efforts um, have achieved. And that's all for this week. I really hope you enjoyed this year's coverage of Medium 2014. And as I said, I will be releasing one video every day during February on YouTube and SoundCloud from the conference. So if you follow the show on Twitter, Facebook, or LinkedIn, you'll be able to see when they come out. Once again, I'd like to thank CI for sponsoring DMT's coverage of Medium. It wouldn't have been possible without their support. So go and check out the company's website on ci-info.com. Thanks so much for listening to this week's DMT. Have a fantastic week and until next time.